Happy Saturday, folks. This is so bad. It's good with Ryan Bailey. Uh, listen, I wasn't planning on doing this, but I listened. I read some show notes um, from one of my favorite accounts, Vanderpod Recaps, and that led me to actually listen to the podcast that uh, Rachel, the artist formerly known as Raquel Levis, just released. And I found it really interesting. So I listened to it and I wanted to talk about it and kind of go through it with you guys because it's something that I've been, I think so many there's so many interesting things. I, I don't mean in terms of, you know, Rachel goes rogue. The podcast to me is really hit and miss. And it's very, it's so meta and it's interesting coming on the heels of this week's episode, which was already meta, which is like a peek behind the curtain of the, the gang reacts to Rachel's uh, awful podcast with Bethany Frankel. Um, and I already found that kind of interesting because I was like, okay, we, we actually have, you know, I know exactly where I was when that came out. Like, it's very interesting, these events that we're seeing and flashbacks, but not, you know, we're talking six, seven months ago and then seeing where we are today and seeing how we've grown and seeing how we have not grown. And her podcast is always really interesting to me. And why I say it's meta is that this is one person. And I was talking about this last week when she had Joe on. Um, it's really interesting when somebody is prioritizing their mental health, which I think is a, a, a truly amazing thing uh, that not a lot of people do, but prioritizing your mental health and then starting a podcast when you were on your journey of mental health, I can, I feel like it can be really messy. So I think at times the podcast has gotten extremely messy and I feel like it's almost turned her into more of a cast member that would be on Vanderpump rules than it has anything else. And it's really hard I mean, I think these shows are so fascinating because you can actually relate them to your own lives. You can relate them like not the not the fame and the money and the success part, but just the basic the basic things, you know, um, about, you know, uh, uh, cheating, lying, stealing, all of these kind of things, friendships. Uh, the, there are seasons for friendships. Sometimes we'll take a break from friends, come back. There's so many different little messages on these shows and then on these podcasts. And and unfortunately or fortunately for Rachel, you know, she is still a part of the conversation. And the more this podcast goes on, the more I realize she wants to be a part of this conversation. She wants to be in this. And I think there almost is this itch that she's not going to be able to scratch until she gets back on TV. And I think that's probably so buried in her subconscious of no, no, no. But even in this podcast, when she, you know, kind of rails against, well, you know, my story being told without me. Well, no, your story is being told. You are telling your point of view. It's just hard, though, because it's hard to tell your story when it's in a vacuum. It's hard to tell your story when other people aren't chiming in because there are multiple sides to every story, right? There's yours. There's theirs. There's what actually happened. There's how your friends perceive it. There's how strangers perceive it. And the horrible thing for these people that they are on a show where we all do comment. I do a silly podcast. Everybody makes their memes. Everybody does their Reddit threads like that. It, it's part of it's part and parcel. So sometimes where I think the initial thing of of. You know, going away to a mental health facility for months upon months to me, that that was the action that blew me away. But then ever since then, I think there's been like really bright moments in terms of Rachel discovering who she is. I think the uncomfortable part is it's like walking on a high wire is that, you know, you're going to fall off a lot. And she's doing that on a podcast. She's saying everything for better or worse. But I feel like sometimes the message is getting really clouded at times. And it's not coming from a mental health perspective anymore, in my opinion. I mean, there are buzzwords and things like that. But to me, it feels like, oh, I can almost clip this in with Vanderpump Rules and make it like a supersized episode. I could actually be like, oh, this is a great storyline. These are Rachel's talking heads. I could li literally use an AI image of Rachel Levis with the voiceover and, and just put it in between Tom scenes, you know? I mean, th that's what, by the way, if somebody really has the time, I mean, if somebody wants a George Lucas Star Wars, this somebody could do that. And, you know, she is a participant in the season. Like I said, though, it's just a vacuum. So it's not necessarily as gripping. And of course, more people are going to watch the show than listen to her podcast, even though I think the podcast does really well. Uh, like I thought last week, though, is 
where do we go at the end of the season? You know, and you know, I'm sure, I'm sure she has a plan, but as you will see, I mean, as I think she will see is that if it goes, if it divests a lot to a whole different area, you're going to lose a lot of listeners. And I think in the long term, that's good because you can actually build what that podcast, what she really wants it to be about or what she actually initially wanted it to be about. But I think what happens is when you get like some kind of success or you see downloads and things like that, you, you know, and when all of a sudden you don't see downloads, you're going to feel the need to like hit that pleasure button of like, we got to get it back up. I got to reveal this. I got to reveal that. I got to reveal this. Um, the other thing too is in the terms of like, this is her own personal story that doesn't make it fact. And the other thing is, I don't know. Let, let's get into this. <laughs> let's, we'll, we'll talk as we go. Um, okay. So we start off the show and it's like, you know, this is Rachel Savannah Levis. And today we are responding to episode 12. So the, you know, even the podcast we are responding to, we are responding to, and she's like, it seems like the whole episode is a response to Bethany Frankel's interview I did back in August. And the cast has many opinions on it. The thing that I don't appreciate is the cast picking and choosing what I said, taking it out of context and spinning it to make it seem like I'm this horrible person, which I did a horrible thing. So right off the bat, I mean, it's, I, I feel like it's interesting when we complain about things that we already know. She already knows the, you know, Vanderpump Rules isn't a 18 hour episode. It's 43 minutes with commercials. Sometimes they'll supersize it. But yeah, you're probably also not seeing even like the, you're not, see, by, by the way, they, I'm sure they filmed so much more about this. So in terms of like cherry picking or picking and choosing and taking out of context, that's reality television. You could, you could argue that everything is taken out of context. And she knows that the thing is like, I would imagine she has emotionally steeled herself for preparation for all of this. That's why this podcast, when she said, I'm going to be responding to these episodes and talking about it, but that's it. So, you know, I'm glad she has this forum to tell her side of things, but I think it's interesting when you are uh, shocked or dismayed in how it comes out. Like, I'm not shocked. I, I'm almost shocked that it wasn't the entirety of the episode. I'm shocked that we didn't. Get, I would have loved to have heard more about it, but they've got other storylines where we're pinning sperm on uh, Lala's vaginal area at one point. Like, we, we you know, we got to move on at some point, which, Rachel, that's the whole point. We got to move on at some point. Even I'm saying it now. But she says, it seems like their response to my podcast was a little extreme. <laughs> Okay, this was when this is the line that made me like per, like kind of wake up was like Zoics, my behavior was it seemed a little it seemed the, the cast behavior seemed a little extreme. Really? It seemed tepid to me at best. Like, but at the same time, Rachel, don't you understand that would be their reality? That would like their response was a little extreme. No, you didn't talk to anybody for so long. And then all of a sudden you come out with, finally, we're hearing, even though I thought Bethany did a horrendous job at her questioning because she doesn't really watch the show, you know, we finally get to hear your story. How is that a little extreme? No, not extreme. I mean, by the way, no, no, no. And you knew, like you had disconnected with Tom, which I thought was a really smart move, but you know, he's going to have thoughts on this. And if you know Tom, he lives his life on camera. That's how he pictures everything in his head. So how would this ever be a little extreme for you? No. I mean, I, I, I honestly thought, like I said, this, this could have been way worse. We're finally hearing things out of your mouth. You, the last time we had heard anything from you was on the final part of the reunion where, you know, the reunion happened and then we cut to you in a talking head and you're crying, all of these things, and then you 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 go away for a long period of time. So of course, like I, I just I feel like that was the line where I was like, wait, how do you feel like this is a little extreme? It, I mean, the whole situation extreme to begin with. The fact that you're doing a podcast, even like that now we're into episode twenty, just talking about Vanderpump Rules. You could argue that could be a little extreme as well. But she says, I'm trying not to get wrapped up in it because I was watching this and prepping these side-by-side -side videos that I posted on Instagram. You're trying not to get wrapped up in it? That's the whole thesis statement I feel of Rachel Goes Rogue is I am fully wrapped up in it. And how could you not be? It's your life. 
It's the last year and a half to two years of your life, even longer if you count the relationship with DJ James Kennedy. So it's like, no, these are the statements where I'm like, oh man, you got, you still got a long way. I mean, we all have an insanely long way to go. I have no behavior figured out on my, like, of course, but I'm trying not to get wrapped up in it. Girl, you are fully ensconced. You are ensconced in the Vanderpump Rules velvet. Um, And yeah, she was prepping these side-by-side videos. So she was already trying to argue her case. She said, it really took me into this vortex tunnel that I don't like to be in. I feel like you've been in that vortex. I feel like you've not gotten out of that vortex. I feel like, I I don't know. I, I just, from an outsider's perspective, it feels like you are fully in the vortex. I think the, maybe she's conflating or misconstruing like weeks that it's easier on her weeks that the show doesn't revolve around her, but now it does revolve. So maybe that's like, it's a little more intense because it is talked about more and we're actually talking about your actions. Now, remember Rachel was, they wanted her to come back. They desperately wanted her to come back. Um, so they're still going to, and by the way, this was told at BravoCon at the producers panel, they were still going to tell Rachel's story because Rachel was a part of this, you know? And I, I, I'm, don't mean Rachel's story in the sense of this is how they feel like, but they're going to you because this was actually going on in this cast lives is dealing with the Rachel of it all. Uh, she says, this show is not healthy for me and it tar- targets my insecurities and I don't like it. I don't love being in an emotional state of feeling like I need to defend myself. And I felt like this episode was an attack on my character. Um, listen, I'm so happy that you realize this show is not healthy for you. I don't imagine it's healthy for it, any of the cast of Vanderpump Rules. I mean, you could look at it from any angle and it's not healthy. Um, and yeah, it, it's upsetting. Um, you know, sometimes I, I would recommend just shutting it off completely, but you are now making a paycheck off of it. You are actively having to be in it due to this podcast. So it's hard to ever truly move on when you are then financially making money off of something that made you feel bad. So in a sense, you're still a part of the reality show. It's just your reality show is an audio podcast Um, and attack on your character. uh, Listen, they're going to have their questions. Your story kind of goes all over the place and we get more and more revealed about your story as you become clear, as you realize potentially what was done to you, as you realize what your part in all of this was, which I think that is the part that gets a little murky when I just listen to Rachel of her actual part in this, because she can tell very clearly conversations she had even in this episode where she's like, listen, I started dating because Tom, you know, Tom wouldn't do what he said about breaking up with Ariana. So I said, that's very unfair. So she actively, you know, I mean, obviously this is all swayed by Sandoval, but she was actively thinking thoughts about, listen, you know, if you're not going to do this, I'm going to do this. Um, obviously she was in love or deep like with Tom Sandoval at the time. So she wanted this, but you know, those were her actions. She did just like Sandoval was a complete douchebag throughout this entire thing. Um, but she said, if I don't defend myself, then people are just going to consume that and assume that that's actually what I said. And it's not, I'm going to let them rewrite my narrative. What they're saying is not true. And we're here to dispute that today. Court is in, we've got the Rachel court in session, folks. Bang that gavel. What I would like to do is with my producers, read some of the quotes, what the cast claims I said versus what I actually said in the Bethany Frankel interview. By the way, the, the transcript from my heart says Frinkle. I always say Frankel instead of Frankel, but I like that iHeart's transcript says Frinkel. The Bethany Frinkel. <laughs> I know it's AI that does this, but it's like, Bethany Frinkel? Oh, she Frinkled it up. Oh, did you hear that Frinkel? Ugh. Uh, the first one is... Uh... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to break into a laughing fit. Um, the first one they're talking about is, uh, you know, referencing that uh, that uh, Rachel was just acquaintances with Ariana. So this is with Sheena. And she says, what I actually said was Ariana and I were not best friends. We were acquaintances who became friends through the show. She's always been somebody who's been very sweet to me. She would stand up for me and encourage me to pursue whatever I was pursuing. And that, and and she goes, and that was all great. (laughs) That that was all pretty good. But we never had like a deep conversation that I would have with a best friend. 
And she says, okay, so I was explaining the purpose of saying that we were acquaintances that became friends through the show was to demonstrate that the narrative that was being put out there that Ariana and I were best friends is false. And I still stand by that. Yes, Ariana uh, Ariana and I, you know, we hung out in group settings, but I stand by what I said. We didn't have those in-depth conversations. And I acknowledge what I did was messed up. I get like, (laughs) that should be the end of the sentence right there. I get it. Like I get any level of friendship. It's still messed up. I understand, but production chose to run with the narrative that I, Ariana and I were best friends, and that's not the case. Okay, so that's an interesting thing, too, is that only uh, Rachel in her head can actually tell us what she felt for Ariana. But to Ariana's point in the talking head, it was either two ways. She actually kind of, you know, is telling herself these things to, you know, we all make excuses for ourselves, or she really just didn't give a fuck all about Ariana in the first place. And I think that's the part that Rachel is tiptoeing around is at the end of the day, you didn't give a fuck all about Ariana. This isn't a right and wrong, but just in that moment, in that you did want Sandoval to broke out. You didn't like Ariana. You thought you saw it from Sandoval's perspective. You saw this person and going, how dare her not get pins and batteries? How dare her do all of these things? Withhold sex from the God of Tom Sandoval. You had to have thought these things. And, you know, I will say, though, in reality shows and and maybe like you didn't have any deep conversations, it sounds like the only quote unquote deep conversations you were having at that time was Mr. Tom Sandoval, who must have been blowing your mind on potential substances, watching a galaxy light and talking for five to six hours about the deeper meanings of the universe. I can only imagine because those in your head are deep conversations, right? But Ariana and by the way, they're not hanging out at like I. I I can even name a couple of times that where you hung out with Ariana by yourself, but whatever your memory wants to be is what it is. And in a group setting, this is still somebody that completely supported you. You're also then taking away Ariana's actual thoughts and feelings of like, well, she thought you were really good friends. And I will tell you from the handful of times that I was around you, I thought you were really good friends just from an outsider's perspective, which doesn't, doesn't show me what's in your heart. But from an outsider's perspective, yeah, I thought it. I don't know best friends, but at the same time, as we grow older, it's very funny, the concept of best friends. You know, I don't know if I believe in that concept as I once did when I was in high school. Um, so I thought that was an interesting thing to th- say. Um, so, and also the production chose to run with the narrative that I, Ariana and I were best friends. That, that was the actual thing. That, that was part of the narrative. They even saw it. It's on camera. They, you know, yes, your Instagrams were flooded. So also at that point, if your Instagrams are flooded and all this stuff, then also you just got to admit at that point, which is not a bad thing to admit. I fucking loved at that time being on reality television. I loved that my star was rising. When I was DJ James Kennedy, I was being called a Bambi eyed bitch and things weren't going my way. And finally, I had this team of people rallying around me, including Tom Sandoval, including Ariana Maddox, that brought me up to the forefront, that tried to make me believe in myself, that bought me these fancy sunglasses from Tom and Ariana, like all of these things you have to admit. And it felt pretty good. Sheena was having your back. I mean, this was your first season where it kind of was like Rachel. I mean, I remember arguing about this on my own show going, wow, we have a really Rachel like thing where she is coming out, coming out into her own. And when you come out into your own, when you are not the main character in your own life for a long time, it can be really intoxicating and it can be really messy because you don't have the, you don't know. These are all new things. So you're making mistakes right and left. That happens in life, but you're also making them on television. You're making really sloppy moves behind the scenes which that happens as well. But I think then to go back, I mean, that's what we all do. We try to explain and and it's so hard to explain sometimes our thoughts in the moment. And that's hard in retrospect to go back because I think a lot of this just chalks up to, I don't know, man, I was so fucking lost. I was so lost. I didn't even know in the moment how lost I was. And I was literally trying to hang on for dear life for anybody that shone a spotlight on me. And Tom seems to be one of those people, and there are a handful of people in everyone's lives, if they shine a spotlight on you, it makes you feel like the coolest, awesomest, warmest. Like you, you, you They see something in you that you have forgotten in yourself, and it can be so intoxicating. It can be so amazing. And sometimes those are the most dangerous people in the world. And the thing is, they go around doing that to everybody, shining the spotlight, shining the spotlight. And it really feels good to have somebody tell you that you're good. That, that you're amazing, that they see things in you that others don't. Like, that's really, really awesome. 
It can feel, but I, I feel like that's more of the conversation here. But I feel like you were getting gassed up that season by everybody because they truly did believe in you. You know, after DJ James Kennedy, you know, they wanted to actually see you succeed. Which is interesting because then you even see more of DJ James Kennedy's perspective of being so insanely hurt that his friends or what he thought. I mean, he looks like he had a huge boner for Tom Sandoval as well. And all of a sudden for them, like, you know, he's questioning everything is, you know, we all are like separate people. It's so easy for us to go good, bad, good, bad, black, white. And it's just not that case. So where I have like deep empathy for Rachel, but it is hard though, when you go back to argue when it's like, girl, like you just weren't thinking clearly. And obviously you were getting it from all ends, but you were also an active participant in it, which I think you agree with. Anyways, she says, um, you know, she says, I did start hanging out with her in group setting because Tom would always invite me out. So it did seem like we were close friends from the outside looking in. But in those situations, I was hanging out with Tom more than I was hanging out with her. But how would Ariana know that, Rachel? In your head, that's what you're doing. In Ariana's head, you are part of the friend group. How would she know that? That's why I think, like, if anything, a lot of these podcasts should have such a deeper empathy for Ariana, which people seem to get annoyed by. People seem to be like, oh, we can only be so empathetic. We can only be so supportive. It's got to end somewhere. I mean, people bitch and moan that it's got to end of people picking on Tom Sandoval, you know, but everybody seems to bitch equally. It's like, got it. The good stuff's got to end for Ariana, you know? Uh, the producer asks, so did you spend time, did you ever spend time with Ariana off camera away from the show? She said, no, not just us together, which that is not true. Um, and she said, never, no. Tom was, they were sharing Ubers together. They were, anyways, Tom was the one inviting me out and telling me like, it's all good. He would get me in a mental headspace where I felt more comfortable hanging out with her in a group setting, which is, that's the fucked up part right there because they were actively put in a relationship and he was like, no, dude, it's good. It's good. No, just come, you know, because he didn't want his whole house of cards to fall. He, she didn't, like, Ariana wasn't aware of how, you know, quote unquote, miserable Tom Sandoval was. So like, he was like saying like, no, Rachel, you got to, it's going to keep everything at this stasis level. You know, it's going to like, so he would like convince her that's a really disturbing thing too. But even then I wasn't that comfortable because I was drinking so much alcohol. I had heard that from multiple sources away from the show or like around those people that she was, but listen, she was in her twenties. Like, I feel like I've had those periods of time. Like I was like, Oh, well she'll find her way. Hopefully. Um, and she says, and I know this may sound like excuses to some of you guys, but I was not physically comfortable hanging out with her. And I did distance myself quite a bit. And Tom told me that she noticed. Yes, because you knew you were actively doing something against your quote unquote friend that now you're saying is not much of a friend. But yes, you should feel physically uncomfortable. And you so she says she distanced herself. And Tom told me that she noticed. Now, this is interesting, too. Uh, there is a part of me that does not believe that Tom told the truth in that moment. I think Tom told Rachel that Ariana noticed because Tom was noticing and Tom was like, you're going to fuck up my whole game. You're going to fuck up my timeline if you don't hang out with us. So get your ass together. Like, I'm curious if Ariana, because then it makes it seem like Tom and Ariana were having very personal conversations where Ariana was like, why isn't Rachel, why is Rachel distance herself from me? I don't, I don't understand that. I love her so much. That's what that whole section makes me think of. So either way, it's kind of dark. If Tom just lies to Rachel or if it's the truth, that just means Tom was actually having very personal conversations with Ariana about friends which then goes against the narrative about Tom not being close to Ariana. This is where it gets so interesting. So now we're like a year later and you're there rehashing. And how does it make you feel now that a year has passed? The producer asks, and she's like, I feel like I've done so much personal growth and the way that the show is talking about me. It's like attempting to keep me confined in a box labeled home wrecker or like shame or, or a bad person. And I've done everything in my power to change my behavior. So it's like a weird time capsule re-experiencing all this with a little more context, getting the cast reactions to it. I mean, this is a great comment because I always wonder about reality shows in general. Like I wonder about the cast of The Hills going back and watching things. It's always fascinating to talk to Spencer and Heidi about things, you know, from their perspective now, as opposed to when they were in the heat of all of this. And, you know, it, fame does weird things. Things. And also, you know, video like that's it would be a nightmare if you had your life on a reality show or even some fragment of your life, not just in the sense that you're sharing, but also in the sense that how they cut it up and edit it and storyline it, because you would know you would find out things about yourself that you weren't even aware about yourself. Up to this moment, Rachel's big storyline was that she wasn't a good public speaker. And even the DJ James Kennedy of it all, you know, we had her throw down. If you don't, you know, stop drinking alcohol, it's 
it's it's going to be over for us. And we had that kind of, but like, we didn't really, I thought Rachel for all intents and purposes, and I've said this multiple times with a blank slate, I did not know what was going on in there. And I don't mean that in a negative thing. I just thought we're, there's all types of people in the world. That's, that's it. But yeah, personal growth, great. But she's like, and the way the show is talking about it, it's like they're attempting to keep me confined in a box labeled homewrecker. I don't think anymore the homewrecker thing, uh, I, I don't think of Rachel as a homewrecker. I think of Tom as a homewrecker. I don't think of that as, as that's not how I view Rachel at all anymore. I still think Rachel is very confused about this situation. And sometimes I feel like she is stunting her personal growth by the continuing going to the well, like where it's attractive because yes, I get, I get, I get that urge to respond when people talk shit. I have people talk shit about, I, I get that urge. I get it. It's a weird itch that you want to scratch. It's not even that weird. You know, we're, we want to defend ourselves, but sometimes you're not going to be able to do anything in this moment. And you're not even actually settled in how you feel. This is a ho potentially horrible example to make, but I think about Carl Radke on Summer House and, you know, you know, he's been sober for a couple of years now. And I would imagine, and he even said that first year, you're still finding out who you are without all, all these substances, without all these crutches that you lean on. And so you're like kind of almost reborn in a certain way. So you've got to give a little bit of time before you can actually start talking about, you know, like the, it, it's kind of sometimes my argument with Lala of like, you know, now she's like looking down on everybody. It's like, girl, you don't, you're right in the mix. You shouldn't be looking down on anyone, like just like commenting wildly about everybody when I think your own behavior is suspect, maybe not in real life, but on the show. Um, and how disturbing is it that we now like talk about two things, the show and real life, and hopefully we can blend the two at some point. So it is interesting, but I, I get the urge. I just think it's not. Anyways, she's like a weird time capsule. She keeps talking about contacts and the uh, it's bizarre about the cast reactions because it's very easy to get sucked back into that headspace. That's not healthy, which I would imagine this whole podcast is not healthy to some degree, but we'll eat it up. Can you talk a little bit more about that? The producer says, when you put the episode out, what did you expect the cast reactions would be? And she's like, like, so I wasn't sure if the show was still filming. I thought maybe by August they would have wrapped filming, but I guess it makes sense that the cast would have had a reaction. Did you agree to do the Bethany Frankel podcast because you thought they had wrapped filming already? Um, when you put, put it out, what was going on through your head, I really wanted to take accountability for my actions. I wanted to demonstrate that I've reflected on how my behavior had impacted the people around me. And I also wanted to hold the show accountable for the messed up situation, which this is interesting too, because now we're getting in, you know, I don't, we don't really directly address it, but she is, she, there's an active lawsuit, you know, Tom and Ariana, but also talking about the show. I do also wonder from a legal perspective, and I'm not a legal mind, I do wonder if you are putting out so many transcripts of your thoughts. And sometimes I feel like you're directly contradicting yourself. If that weakens your case overall, if any of this is admissible, because I feel like we have now found like direct contradictions in your story. And I'm not saying that she's lying by anything, but I think memories and feelings do change. And she's like, but the way that the network capitalized, uh, capitalized off it and didn't want to protect me at all. And yeah, that was super hurtful. I've said this time and time again, and I hate to burst everybody's bubble and, you know, lean in. Um, do you, I just found this out this last year. Do you realize these companies and stuff like that put these shows out? I just found out they do it to make money. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? They don't even, <laughs> yeah, they're not in it for the art. They are going, you, are you kidding? They are going to cap. Are you fucking kidding me? One of the worst things, worst like pieces of human behavior on this show, you're they're going to capitalize it until kingdom come. They are going to freak out. This is their lucky day. They are going to be able to help the other shows on their network, the failing shows. They're going to be able to launch the Valley. They're going to be able to sell merch. Oh my God. Bravo, Con, Are you kidding me? What did you expect would happen? Tom knew. That's why Tom tried to keep it off the show. Anyways, the protecting of it all is also an interesting thing because I do feel they potentially would have quote unquote protected her more if she agreed to come back on the show. Anyways, she's like, I wanted to call that out. And Bethany seemed like her values were in alignment with me. <laughs> Are you admitting that you want money? And I wasn't really so much thinking about, Oh, how is the cast going to react? But isn't that interesting too, is that I think you were, because it seems like you are so concerned with how the cast reacts about everything. You seem like you have such a watchful eye on everything. She looks at everything. She looks at your Instagram story. She looks at like, you'll catch Rachel like everywhere. So it is weird. And I think Lala kind of does this as well is that saying of, listen, I don't even look at this stuff. 
dude, you look at this stuff. You look at this stuff more than I look at this stuff. And I look at this stuff a lot. I mean, you're making videos, you're making, I mean, you are, and by the way, a compliment that's very business minded in a way. Like, I feel like all these tactics and things that you're doing can be used in other venues and other ways as you move forward in life. I mean, you're teaching yourself editing, you're being a little detective here and there. I mean, these are things that you can actually use and you can use them properly, hopefully. Um, she says, I already had fractured friendships with the cast, all of them. It was kind of like a done deal, but I will say at the time I was still protecting Tom and I chose not to throw him under the bus because I still had those feelings for him where I didn't want to quote unquote betray him, even though he betrayed me first. So I wasn't very hard on him and I definitely didn't talk about him the way I talk about him now. So there's been more processing that I've been able to do. Of course, as time goes on, you process things in a different way. You can leave a relationship sort of like, okay with it and get angrier over time, or you can leave a relationship angry and then kind of get more wistful about it over time as well. So that makes sense. But I still think like, listen, I love the way that like, I didn't throw time. Tom's like pouting the whole episode of like, what's up, dude? Podcast. I listened to it, dude. So many ads, so many ads. No, I hurts me, dude. She says she didn't love me at all. So that was the thing that Tom really found hurtful, but you found yourself protecting him still, which to me, I would have loved for Bethany to ask any sort of questions of knowledge of the show of like, do you still feel like you're protecting Tom? And you say at the time you were. So I found that a fascinating comment. Uh, the producer, did you expect the cast reactions to be on the season? And she's like, no, it was kind of like, whoa, this was an intense episode right now. Yeah, I was not expecting that. So watching the reactions back now, are they kind of in alignment with what you would expect from them or did some surprise you? And she says, that's a good question. I feel like they demonstrate their characters consistently. Sheena coming to mind how she reacted like with a lot of anger, but I certainly didn't expect to be talked about to the level of being this topic of this entire episode. Speaking of Sheena, the next quote that I would like to pull from the episode is uh, talking to Ariana Lala saying she and I had some savior complex in regards to Sheena. Remember that our friendship was equally beneficial as far as I helped her. She helped me. And then she was like, I paid rent. I paid the bills. I'm like a bitch. You contributed 1000 to my $4,300 rent. You didn't pay for parking. You didn't pay for cable. You didn't even stock toilet paper, girl. And you had sex in my bed. What I actually said was, um, you know, Sheena was one of my best friends. She offered her apartment to me, Rachel says, while I was figuring out my next moves after breaking up with James. She kept this apartment in LA, but wasn't living in it. It's because she's living down in San Diego, but she started creating this narrative that she was a sister I never had and the mother like a mother to me and that she gave me a place to live when nobody else, you know, put me up anywhere uh, that I didn't pay rent, which is not true. I did pay rent. Okay, so this is interesting, but we all, like, she made this narrative. You let her make this narrative. You know, like you also then are then divorcing yourself from responsibility is that you let that narrative out there. I, I mean, I saw interviews with both of you guys. And yes, Sheena does that with a lot of her relationships because I think she truly believes that. I don't think that's bullshit. I think Sheena believes she was truly a sister to you. I think Sheena, whether people like to admit, Sheena feels very deeply. And yes, she did come to your aid when you were in a breakup with DJ James Kennedy. Your quote unquote friends were helping you out. But like, that's why I think it's so silly is that, of course, they would also divorce you after this fucking thing with Scandival because of what you did. But like DJ James Kennedy, they thought he was in the wrong for this relationship. So they were all helping you out. They all wanted you to do good. Um, so uh, she's cat sat for our, uh, for Sheena and uh who was pumped with mercury for a treatment so great you, you sat for a cat she couldn't be near the cat because she was breastfeeding for her daughter great and i also did her podcast and she said the podcast that i did with her talking about my breakup with james was the number one most listened to podcast maybe at the time it was but also yeah like all the cast goes on each other's podcast and by the way i have to say there's a question in my mind if that's even true like sheena might have just been telling you that to pump up your ego who knows who knows but just because someone is like, you know, that's a compliment to you that people are interested in your story, but don't say that's me doing you this huge favor. Like you guys were doing each other's favors. Sure. But at the end of the day, she did let you stay in a place for very cheap rent. So the fact that you keep arguing this point is that like, yes, I took her up on that. But she says, it's unfortunate that she's trying to create this narrative that I've taken advantage of her when I feel like I did contribute in a way that would really saying you're saying it was quid pro quo. It was mutually beneficial, mutually beneficial relationship within a television show, which is all murky anyways, which is, yeah, it's all murky anyway, but mutually beneficial, but it's more beneficial to you at the end of the day. Like I, I, I see where you're trying to go for, and I just don't know if it holds as much weight as you think it does in your head. And I'm really trying to take everything that she's saying very seriously, 
But at the end of the day, she, it, she still did those things for you, period. You weren't offering. I mean, you went on her podcast and you cat sat for her. Like that, that those, that's amazing. That's what friends do for each other, right? I think Sheena went above and beyond and also stood up for you in multiple arguments, you know? Anyways, Sh- Sheena's uh, going tit for tat and she offered her apartment for me to stay. At that time, I was struggling with a heartbreak and I wasn't sure if I was going to go back to the show. And this is the struggling with a heartbreak. But remember, Rachel was the one that decided to end the relationship with DJ James Kennedy. So DJ James Kennedy struggling from a heartbreak. You're struggling from a heartbreak. And I understand that even if you broke up in the relationship, you would still feel something very deeply. But it was also very positioned very differently, even if I'm remembering back to the reunion where the 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 breakup was announced and you know gave him back the ring and James was like that's a bitcoin right there that's one bitcoin this ring but she said I wasn't sure if I was going back to the show or if I was going to go back to school to get my masters girl you were always going back to the show I don't even know maybe you're just confused if you weren't going to get invited back to the show but also go get your masters this is the time she was like, you're helping me out by just paying $1,000 because I'm not living in this apartment. Also, when friends don't want to hurt your feelings, they're going to position it as you're helping them. Like, girl, no, no, no. You're helping me. Don't feel bad. You're helping me. So listen, I, I feel like this is where, to me, it even gets murky. But she's like, I was helping her by staying in this place that was empty. Like, girl, she could, if she really was helping her, she could put it on Airbnb and rent it out. Um, she was like, take the master bedroom when Brock and I are gone. And the, then the way she's like, oh, she had sex in my bed. Like, yeah, you knew that. Like you were encouraging me. You were setting me up with different guys to go on dates with. And she encouraged me to talk about my sex life on her podcast that we filmed on her bed. Yeah. Oh, Sheena set this all up. Sheena, Sheena made like at a certain point you do, we do, everybody does have to accept the, you know, what you did, what you did with your own body. Sheena was not, you know, maybe you felt like Sheena was manipulating certain things in your head, but she was not manipulating your body. She wasn't like, this goes here, this goes there, this goes there. This is where you put the pee pee. This is where you like, no, but also she was encouraging you after a breakup, go do it up. And that's what Sheena's always done. And you probably loved it. You were probably giggly about it. You were probably, but yeah, but yes, in retrospect, Sheena, of course, is going to say that, especially if you didn't wash the sheets. Uh, then they move into Allie and James talking. Allie says she was just upset after you, after the breakup, she wasn't over you. She never actually loved Tom. Um, which is funny because that's not what she was saying last summer. And then it like flashes back to me telling Andy Cohen that I was in love with Tom at the reunion. And that is what I actually said. And then the producer goes, were you what you believe to be in love with Tom? And she says, I believed I was in love with Tom at the time. I now look back and see that I was not in love with him. I also don't believe that he was truly in love with me either. I agree. Looking back on your relationship with Tom today, do you think, that what you had was love. And she says, I think there was a part of me that was in love with him, but true love is not somebody calling you selfish for you, like taking care of your basic needs. And I don't think Tom really loved me. I don't know what love is anyway. Like, I don't know what love anyway. Like it was definitely intense. It was definitely infatuation. It was manipulative. It was secretive on both of your sides. You guys, it was toxic in the way because there were secrets. It was not healthy. And because of all those things, I don't think that was actually love. I thought I was in love with Tom at the time. I really did. And it took me a long time to get over him and choose no contact with him. I thought there was a future for us. You know, it was infatuation, but I thought maybe it could develop into real, real love girl. I feel like you, you did your, this is where the real work came in as you saved yourself from this because you see in Tom in the show, he had a whole storyline plan for you guys. He literally had it all. Like he laid out the season in his head. And I think he would actually admit that, but he would admit it in a positive way. Like, of course, because he looks at his life like a reality show because he's been on these 11 seasons, but yes, like I thought this was the wisest part of this whole podcast. And you know, all of these things that she is saying is true. And I'm curious five years from now, how she will look back on this as well. And I'm sure even with all of this, there are positive things that she took from this relationship or things that he told her or conversations they had that she will look back in retrospect and say, okay, that actually, that actually did. That was real. Um, but yeah, all of these things are true. Um, and you know, our hearts are so weird and messed up. I, I keep listening to that Taylor Swift album and so many songs are about Maddie Healy, which now people are arguing it was a longer relationship than it was. But even if it was like short, you can meet, have short relationships that like really bust you wide open that really mean so much to you in retrospect. You know, our hearts are all different and all weird and, and things like that. But yeah, it, it's hard. And I think that's the hard thing for Tom is because Tom thinks in his head he really felt it. But 
Tom's having a hard time going like, oh yeah, it was a kind of destined to fail because of these things. Were there any signs to you before you weren't, you went actually into the facility? Were you like, were you grappling with this before you went in? And she says the main issue, the main source of our arguments where he needs to break up with Ariana publicly because it's not, <laughs> which that was a weird word publicly, not privately. You need to do it publicly. Page six, baby, because it's not fair to me, nor is it fair to Ariana. And he would say that I was holding that over his head. <laughs> You're holding that over my head, dude. I'm going to dip out. He's actively breaking up with her. And he said he was actually breaking up with her and he's taking all the right steps to do that as an amical way. Dude, I'm going on Howie, dude. I'm going like, he's like, I'm trying to make her feel bad about sex, pin and battery. So I'm doing the thing that I need to do. My God, this guy's decision and our biggest argument is, no, she goes, my God, this guy's delusion. And our biggest argument is when I say, saw someone else, like I was seeing someone else before Tom and I got involved. And this is a person that I was talking about on Sheena's podcast, Nima, right? He hit me up and we hung out and I told Tom about it and he called me a sociopath. And I said, well, that's not fair because I want to be exclusive with you. But since you're not exclusive to me, hence being in a public relationship, that's not fair to me. You know, like I'm in my twenties, I'm supposed to be living my life and I'm supposed to be dating other people. And he's like, yeah, he really threw me for a leap because then he accused me of being a sociopath. You're being a sociopath, dude. You're being Jack Taylor right now, dude. I mean, this is all rich from both sides, but mainly from Tom of just like, holy shit, dude, you called her a sociopath because she was dating. But also the main issue says, in the main issue, our source, he needs to break up when Ariana publicly because it's not fair. This whole thing is very interesting. Um, Because I, I don't understand the verbiage. I was seeing someone before Tom and I got involved. And that is the person I was so... If you and Tom, before you got involved, do you just mean physically? Because then this puts the timeline in deeper disarray because before you got involved, he hit me up and we hung out. And I told Tom about that. So that's Nima, right? He called me a sociopath. And I said, that's not fair because I want to be exclusive with you. So I'm assuming because you said it's before and I got involved, but then you're having conversations where I want to be exclusive with you. But since, I mean, but that is rich for him to be like, you can't date anybody else, but I'm in this full relationship. But it also shows you that Rachel was very aware of what was going on. She was aware that Tom was in a full blown relationship that had not broken up. So those arguments, even in like the Joe, my gosh of it all, Joe of like, yes, they were actively cheating. They knew they were actively cheating, right? They both were aware. Other people around them were aware, Joe and Schwartz. I think just Joe might not have conveniently listened to whatever was being told to her. Who knows? Um, but it is wild. It's wild for Tom to have that thing. Like he was legitimately doing that. Anyway, so now looking at it again in live time, you're reliving, reliving it through these episodes, the producer says. And then yet after the show in real time is real time. And he is really claiming, you know, that you, the, you're the bad guy in this situation. and You let him on. He's so hurt and he's the only one that worked on himself. Like, how does that make you feel? Rachel, if you're listening, I want you to know. We don't buy that. We get how silly that all came off. We understand. We understand. And by the way, I think that's why Sandoval actually makes good television this season is we get it. Like it's, it's almost laughable if it didn't cause people so much pain. Um, she's like, well, gosh, yeah, he's making it seem like he's a victim of me. Both James and Tom made it sound like they were victims of me in this episode. And once again, Tom calling me selfish, which makes me, I do like that. They positioned her as a temptress. Rachel is the temptress, you know, but it is like boys and their toys, right? Tom calling me selfish, which takes me back to the times that he would call me selfish for extending my stay in the facility to keep working on myself. I think it's just ironic because Tom and I didn't know what work because Tom, I don't know what work he's done, but it does not show. It doesn't trick girl. You're right. We all see that man. Just journaling and breath work and cold dips do not do anything. Um, in the long term, I mean, they're good, like fun things to try. And I think they can be great in addition to real therapy. Uh, Tom goes on to say, Rachel to Tom Schwartz. I don't understand how she could think I was anything, but somebody who just loved and cared about her. I would do anything for her. I also want to say like, I don't know in conversations about grooming and I'm a guy myself, so I don't have the place to talk on this, but I do sometimes wonder how much Tom even thinks like if Tom truly understands his own behavior or what he did, like Tom, if he, like, I think he had this narrative in his head or what he was trying to do, but I don't think he thought, I, I don't know. Never mind. I'm going to, I don't know. I just, uh, anyways. And I'm not trying to victimize myself here either. Rachel says, like, I'm taking these active steps to never put myself in that situation again. I mean, but I, I, I think that's great in relationships, but you shouldn't actively put yourself in a situation like talking about reality shows either or being a part of this mess because it's a mess. And you said, even this week, you're so triggered. Like, we're, I mean, this is the, where I feel like 
I don't know. And I, she said, I'm able to recognize the red flag. So I don't put that myself in that situation again, but he wanted to control me. And if I went to, what if Rachel went to summer house? Maybe that's the show. I went to work on myself. Then he became the victim of me because now his needs aren't getting met because I'm not there. Yes. You in his head are the victim of you, but we understand your side right here. I think we do. Um, I will say in all the conversations that he had with me, you were trying, he, that with me too, you were trying to better yourself. And I mean, this is the part that blows my mind An inpatient facility to work with counsel 24 to seven. And he was saying that you were selfish. The producer says he was saying that you weren't seen to his needs. And he was telling me all the time that you had to get out of there. You were being brainwashed. You were being brainwashed. So the producer talked to Tom during this time. So Tom was like, she's being brainwashed in there, dude. You, what are they telling her? Good stuff? No, dude. Don't tell her how minds work. <laughs> I don't even think Tom understands how minds work. So that's really interesting that he was saying she was being brainwashed. You have to reintegrate into society as quickly as possible and get back on the show, Tom was saying. Yeah, by the way, that's the thing. When you get off of this like madcap race car and slow down, you start to see things that are like, holy shit. This is wild. That's why we as the audience are so weird because we have the perspective of watching this and not being an active participant in it, even though it's like virtual reality at this point. And we're hearing all of these different sides and all of these podcasts on top of the show. It just gets to be such a mess. She's like, why would anybody think somebody would choose to go to an inpatient facility for three months if they didn't think they needed it? And Rachel's like, well, he tried to talk me out of going multiple times. He successfully talked me out of going the first time. And I chose to go to the reunion. He was telling my parents that this place was going to brainwash me, that it's a cult, that I can't go there. God, those are the things. <laughs> this is how dark. Th and by the way, this is where I'm a problem. I hear this and I'm like, God, that would have been a good scene. Damn, that would have been good on reality TV. Um, she says, he knew that I would get good therapy and it would jeopardize his control over me. I wonder if it was that clear of a thought in his head. So knowing all of this and seeing his reaction, um, was that surprising to you and said, no, he's upset about, I believe that we see Tom breaking down on this episode because he's upset that he's officially has lost control of me. Like I've gone rogue. Uh, I get it. Rachel gone rogue. And that's why he's upset. And I think he's scared when Tom is talking to James later in the episode throughout the whole process. I really try to look out for Raquel. I'm realizing now that I care for her way more than she cared for me. Tom said, and they said, what are your thoughts on that? And she's like, yeah, he tried to look out for me. No, he didn't. He didn't care. He didn't care how all of this was going to affect me. He probably knew that eventually this was going to come to light and he did not do anything to protect me. And they said, do you think he actually believed that he was looking out for you? I don't know. I don't know. But when he says that I cared for her way more than she cared for me, I substitute the word care for control. I think that's very great. I think that's dead on, Rachel. Like uh, caring is not controlling behavior. And maybe in his brain, he felt like he was looking out for me, but he wasn't. No, I really don't believe that he was. And I don't believe that he thought he was like he was deciding to, I don't know, like get involved like this, knowing that I was too like this is where my piece of accountability comes in too. Oh, uh, we've gotten there finally. And maybe I can give him a little more of grace because he was going through a tough time in life with the bar opening and all of his money going into it. And he wasn't happy in his relationship and he needed to seek. I mean, he was drinking a lot too. Yeah. I mean, Tom, obviously, I don't think any of us were aware how bummed he was about his life. And then when this all accidentally came out, he was able to tell us, you know, all of these real feelings. And I think the one piece of empathy I have for him is I didn't, see it. But like, he was like, dude, I'm like, you know, in, in my forties, dude. And I realize, you know, I'm lost and I don't feel sexy anymore. And I don't want to take away from those feelings, even though we were kind of laughing about it when it first was said, you know, I'm sure there was a very scary place for him to be of like, is this all there is Vanderpump, you know? And, and I mean, I think a lot of us men and women obviously go through these things. Um, but the thing was, then he was trying to then take a piece of sun, his like trying to find other sunshines like Rachel and put them in to make him feel better instead of actually just working on himself. Because that's sometimes the hardest thing to do in your life is work on yourself. That's why I always say, Rachel, that was the coolest thing that I think she could have done is go work on herself. But she says, in a way we found each other to escape together. Yeah. And that's probably how he positioned it. And it was like the perfect storm, but I don't believe that he was truly looking out for me at all. Plus, if you think about respecting somebody, caring for somebody, loving somebody, you don't record somebody on an intimate FaceTime without asking permission first, if you really care about that person. True. A hundred percent. But also then I don't think you sue the person um, afterwards that you actually kind of actively all betrayed. But what, what do I know? I'm not a legal mind. He goes on to say, I'm listening to this shit. This, you know, it's bullshit. It's goddamn disrespectful. Yeah. This is when you really saw the real Tom Sandoval. She used me and now she's throwing me away. <laughs> she's like, it's wild. His mindset. He believes that I used him. What purpose does it serve me to use Tom Sandoval in this way? It's not to become more famous. I mean, at this point, if it was, I would have gone back for another season of Vanderpump rules. Uh, it's not for storyline purposes for me. I think maybe he's hurt, but he feels used. I think I was really broken and I need somebody to help me process through the heartbreak. And I was experiencing that I was experiencing with James. This is the thing that I found very interesting. And we saw kind of the first episode of season 10 and that, you know, James had moved on rather quickly with Allie. 
And uh, according to Rachel, and I feel like that's when her heartbreak actually started to, because I didn't feel like she was going like through. I mean, I remember the opening of, I don't know. I don't know. This is weird. I would love to hear more about her heartbreak of DJ James Kennedy. I'm sure that will be an episode coming up. Uh, uh, so the person to him through this tough time, me, we were confiding in me about this relationship. So in a way we kind of used each other to escape, but now he wants to play the victim and say that I just used him and throwing him away. Not true. God, I just wish life is so complicated, man. Like we're all victims at a point. We're all heroes in our own story at a point. Uh, life is just legitimately so damn confusing. It really can be. And it's not even like the older you get it. I mean, I hate, I love it. People equate age with like actually knowing, like, I don't know fucking shit about shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, it's, it's so confusing anyway. So now you're in the meadows, the facility. Uh, what are the epiphanies um, that you had realizing that his love wasn't true love or healthy kind of love? And she's like, um, she's like, do you mind if I grab my journal really quick? By the way, yeah, I, I want you to grab your journal. You were both journaling. I'm journaling just like Rachel's journaling. She's like, okay, let's. Uh, so we watch movies at the Meadows, and one of them was Harry Potter. <laughs> the Meadows sounds fun, man. Uh, she's like, Jenny Weasley and Harry Potter in the Chamber of Secrets. When Tom Riddle has her under the spell, he has her to do all these things out of her character, out of her integrity to please Tom. Am I playing the victim role? Wow, it's. <sighs> Man, the deeper messages in Harry Potter. And I, I know there is something about me that I always said of Rachel is very childlike. And I don't mean that in a negative connotation, but it is interesting that you see that she does learn things from almost children like fables and, and fairy tales and stuff, which I found very interesting. She says, intentionally, Tom has manipulated me and he had me under his love spell. So that was intoxicating and fun and quote, and quote, intimate. He turns me against my family. He said that my mom is gaslighting me and manipulating me and that she doesn't have my best interests at heart. My mom has ulterior, ulterior motives. He tries to talk me out of treatment. They're going to brainwash you. Uh, so this, there isn't such a thing called love addiction. This place is a last ditch effort, he said. Extending is a bad idea. You're coming dependent on this place. Oh my gosh, this is so dark. I mean, this is the part that it's like, that's sad, man. He was really coming down. And it's like, man, Tom, dude, you should have left this this one alone when she actually sought real help. Uh, she said, reading this stuff back, she's very thankful that she had this experience to go to mental health and intense trauma therapy. I would love to know what all our trauma therapists think of the show. Like think of the podcast itself as it goes further on. Not at the beginning, but as it goes further on. Um, and I do hope, like I do get scared sometimes. I get scared for the entire cast and my own life is that there are, you know, I, I get scared for relapses. I get scared that this could break Rachel in a sense, you know, because there's only so far a person can, you know, if you're actively reading comments about yourself and things of that nature, you know, you could be doing good in your recovery, but you're still actively participating in it. And then you hit the wrong episode to talk about, and then it could go all away. You know, like we're all three bad moves away from something really dangerous. I feel I, I truly believe that um, he is switching the script on me to manipulate. Yeah. So it's a lot of the same thing. Um, I've been able to talk about it on this podcast. She says it's cool. When I did Bethany Frankel, Frankel's podcast, I wasn't in the space to talk about it so freely. So I think it just goes, but also Rachel, you weren't even asked the right questions to even talk about it freely. I mean, I truly believe that was just the biggest miss in the world. Um, by the way, do you think she'll publish her journals at any point? Is that going to be like a Patreon level or something on the Rachel goes rogue Patreon? If there is one, um, what would you say to her about the girl who wrote those pages in the journal? She's like, I would say, I'm so freaking proud of you. I'm so proud of that. You are finally seeing things for how they truly are not living in the land of the illusion. And this is exactly what is needed to be able to break out of the denial and really face the facts. And the first step to choosing a healthier, safer relationship that you ultimately want. Hell yeah, girl. Like I, I love that. I truly love that. Nothing, no jokes there. Like that's true. That's amazing. Amazing. Uh, she's like, I want to switch gears and talk about something James said to Tom. She got with you because she wasn't quite over me. He said, what are your thoughts on that? And she's like, I mean, I think it's funny that he's interpreting it that way because it feeds his ego. Yeah. I mean, it is the weirdest dick measuring contest that scene in the world, but also DJ James Kennedy cleared Sandoval. And I would love to know what she thought about that. But she's like, in a way, I guess it's a little bit true because I was heartbroken over the fact that James moved on with Allie so quickly and he was shoving it in my face. But you also have to realize though, this is why relationships are so fucking dark is that DJ James Kennedy was out there with the narrative that he was heartbroken over you. And that's why potentially he moved on with Allie so quickly, who turned out to be kind of amazing in his life. I love Allie. 
um, she was shoving it in my face or that I chose to film. And, you know, I guess I signed up for that heartbreak, even though I didn't even know what heartbreak really was in a way I did. I did get with Tom because I wasn't able to process my emotions that I was feeling with James. And I don't know. I think this whole conversation was weird though. Like it was kind of like they were trying to one up each other and like claim their territory. Yes. Oh my God. It shows how idiotic we men are. Like, I mean, truly one of the most idiotic scenes, but if you then take that away, it's just wildly entertaining. And DJ James Kennedy says, spit some hard truths, but it was funny of like the back and forth. Well, she said she was going to break up with you because she didn't think you could stay sober. Okay. Well, she said she never loved you because she was still getting over me. It was a fuck fest for you guys. You weirdos, you creepy little fuck fest. Um, it seems like he was bragging to Tom and she's like, yeah, totally. And by the way, I wonder in Rachel's most honest moments with herself, I mean, did this in a sense, not turn her on, but it was it like, ha look at this, man. It's like pretty funny watching two men that have potentially, I feel done me wrong, fight about me. Is there any sort of feeling about that? Even from a mental health perspective of like, did you have an initial thought about that? Cause you can't control your thoughts and then walk that thought back. Anyways, it's pretty clear that both of these guys have big egos. Yes, but also maybe that's also one of the things that you've been attracted to in men your entire life because you don't have a big ego or maybe you didn't at one point. Um, hearing him say that on the episode when you watch it back, what was your gut reaction to that? I wasn't even really caring what they were saying specifically. It was more of like my reaction to that whole conversation that they had, that back and forth with each other just shows how idiotic both of them are. It's very weird to watch and laughable. I felt uncomfortable watching the entire episode, especially that scene. Anyways, so Lisa says that Raquel possibly, you know, says that any, uh, wait, what is it? Raquel possibly says that it's going to make anybody look at her in a better light. How does that make you feel? Oh, Lisa Vanderpump, Rachel says, you love to ride for your Tom Sandoval, but anything that I say will never change people's point of view. It's like bizarre to me. Also, the way that you were saying like, oh, you know, like Tom has been through so much and all these disclaimers at the beginning of the season of dark thoughts and suicide to hotline stuff. It just seems like production cares about Tom's mental health. But when it's like actually my mental health on the line, they don't take it seriously. They don't care. They don't want to believe that I'm actually going through something when they want a baby Tom. It's just infuriating. It almost feels like hopeless. Now, this is an interesting comment as we wind down here is um, first off, whether you like it or not, whether we, the audience, like it or not. Lisa Vanderpump feels like these are sons to her. They have been 11 seasons of this show. And when you are a mom to a son, particularly, you are going to understand them or try to understand them. They're not going to do a lot of wrong. I mean, OJ's mom, not to give your thumb to OJ. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're, you're, they're going to make excuses. So, of course, but also they built this show together. You think they're going to show you more love than they show Tom Sandoval? You would have to uh, be smoking the wildest weed to ever think that was imaginable. But I also think that you didn't decided not to come on the show. And that's where their concern. I mean, they were concerned, but they weren't like actively trying to ride for you. Um, but yeah, like they were always going to do this. We all went into this season, the audience knowing that they were going to try a redemption season. And I will say, I've heard producers talk about you in a very good light, even off camera away, like personal of wanting to tell your story, but you chose to not want to tell your story in this way. So yeah, there's only so far this show is going to go, but at the same time, you have to realize you're going up against somebody that started this show. And so Lisa Vanderpump was always going to go this way. Plus she protects men more than she protects women. But also like, I think she, at this end of the day, things like, oh, men are just fucking idiots. But I do, I do seem to be drawn to them more than I am women in some situations. Um, I think they did see that you were actually going through something, but I think once you didn't want to actually tell that story and participate, there's only so far that they can go with it. But I also think that's where, you know, part of the reality reckoning is maybe finding better ways to deal with these kind of things. Maybe like if we're taking aside from just getting money, maybe that's a conversation that can actually be really talked about because that part of it is fascinating of what you would have wanted in those moments, what you would have wanted. Would you have wanted them just to stop filming? Would you have wanted them to not talk about it? Would you have wanted them to tell Tom Sandoval he can't come on this year? All of those things I think are interesting, but I think Sandoval, like you knew, like, this is a son to Lisa, whether we like that or understand that at all. Like I, I sometimes find it like completely silly and it's fun to joke about, but it's very real, that relationship. So you were arguing about a, you know, 15 year relationship at this point and you're relatively new and you did not have a good track record. And just because the men that she really, truly loves over time, I mean, you see how she is with DJ James Kennedy as well. And I think if you would came on, it would have been come on. It would have been a different story, but you didn't, you know? So these are unfortunately the after effects. So you're seeing this one side when you, if you had been on it, we would have been able to inject a lot of this, but yeah, of course I agree. You not going back completely. Um, she says, 
I feel like I'm fighting a battle that's impossible to win because they're spending all this stuff. I don't think it's about winning and losing. I don't think it's that. I think Tom completely lost. I think you lost. I think both of you deserve to lose at a certain time. And I think you being able to say this in a certain light, but also you got to give the audience a little bit more credit in how we see things. Yes, a lot of people still side with Tom Sandoval in weird ways, but a lot of people don't. You have to understand that's the way of the world too. You know, there used to be a point where I thought everybody would like me and it's just not the case at all. Anyways, it just seems to be always wrong. Like I can't win. This is the part where I'm like, you, this is where I feel like this podcast is unhealthy. Like it's always wrong. I can't win. It's not, you got to re jigger your mind to not look at it about winning and losing and things always wrong. If you know your truth, stick with your truth, but you're always going to lose to a certain amount of people. You're always, you're not going to be able to, you know, only time will heal this. Why do you feel like the desire to defend yourself and not just walk away completely? It's like, because I've worked so hard on myself. I've dedicated this whole past year to bettering myself and take accountability and change my behavior. And I don't like being misrepresented. Yeah, but your real people, if this this is true, the real people know, but like defend yourself and not just walk away completely. That, that's a huge question that I don't feel like, I don't think she necessarily knows this real answer. You've worked so hard on yourself. So why throw it away for shit like this? Why throw away your peace of mind for shit like this? But if it's, if you're position it in your head to win, then I understand why you're doing this. But I think maybe you need to reframe things um, and not thinking about winning or losing in terms of this because we all lose. Um, she says it's the need for validation and knowing what that limit is because at a certain point it's like, does it even matter? Does it matter what other people think of me? Like it should only matter what the people I interact with in a person or weekly basis or on a daily basis, like actual real conversations and connections and friendships. Exactly. She knows the right answers feeling how I felt after watching episode 12. It just confirmed everything that I suspected because just consuming it made me go mentally unwell. See, that's what scares me for her. And I'm actually able to feel that way by just viewing it. Imagine how I would have felt experiencing it. Yeah. You did the right thing for yourself. But then it's like, you did the right thing. So be proud in that moment and not just upset that, you know, you're not going to be able to control a narrative and a TV show. Anyways, looking back on the Bethany interview, do you, regret, do you regret your decision? Would you have done anything differently? And she's like, I feel like it was the right decision for me to be able to, <laughs> I regret not being asked to be paid um, for me to be able to share my story freely, openly. It gave me some control back. You know, all these stories, all of these eyes, it was just very daunting lies that you also perpetuated. It seemed like there was no light and Bethany gave me a little bit of light. Uh, she's a light giver. And I'm happy that I was able to go on because I shared how I felt in my thought process. Imagine if you had been asked the right questions. I know I'm just harping on this, but it just, as a viewer, it just frustrated me. Uh, I wanted to know for myself so that I could choose better for myself next time. And I feel like I was able to articulate, when are we going to get to, I'm, I'm very curious for Rachel's dating future about choosing and like where we're at in that process, which I think, by the way, Rachel, if you're listening, I think that would be a fascinating episode to talk about where you are in the dating process right now about, are you even there? Are you going to wait another year about choosing for yourself better next time? There's no joke here. I just really am fascinated about that of when you know, and, and how dating will work for you in the future. Anyways, that's it. That is uh, Rachel Savannah Levis, the artist formerly known as Raquel. Rachel Goes Rogue. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, Patreon, this is special for you. Um, maybe I'll release it on YouTube another day, but I wanted you guys to get this first um, because I just want, I needed to talk about this. I needed to talk about it. I, I woke up and I was like, oh my God. Anyways, hope you guys have a great weekend. Enjoy the Taylor Swift album. Talk to you very soon. Bye.